but I'll give you a little briefing on myself and then on upstream as well. Um, I'm a physician by training. I've practiced in in multiple countries. I've practiced in India. I've practiced in England, in the NHS, and then started off in the Bronx uh, at Lincoln Memorial in, in New York. Um, I my somebody today. I think uh, the speaker before me. I can't remember his doc's name, but he was a coward. So was I. Uh, I lost the patience for patience and said, I think medicine is more a business than it is medicine. And so I went in, I went back to school. Uh, I went to Cornell, I got my MBA, I got out of there. And uh, my, I got recruited by a company that does financial turnaround of distressed hospitals. So they found my clinical background with an MBA, a great combination to help. One would think I'd have to travel the whole country. Uh, I did that from 1990 all the way up to 2008. I never had to leave New York. There, there are so many hospitals, and 99% of them are in distress situations. So I was in New York most of my life. Um, did, but I did a couple of others. I did Green, I did Buffalo General, I did DC General here in DC. Um, coming in to revamp the entire clinical side of the distress, which ended up being renegotiating physician contracts and pension plans and all of that stuff. Um, 2013, with the announcement of the Affordable Care Act, I saw clearly ahead of me a different vision uh, on value-based care. And so I leveraged all my experience and knowledge into doing that. I was at that point, I had employed 89 doctors to serve the distressed hospitals who could recruit physicians. And I converted all of them into two different ACOs in New Jersey. And then I created a new ACO in Cleveland um, and one in Detroit, depressed neighborhoods of course. Had a fair amount of success and then a colleague of mine for my medical school started upstream. He was the head of the head of cardiology at Nassau County Medical Center, and then at Geisinger, uh, and then uh, at CMMI. So he said, let's think of something different. So we got together and now we are part of upstream. Upstream is a, a company, uh, I would like to define it like an MSO that comes into provider organizations, predominantly physicians, uh, independent and otherwise, and help them move from fee-for-service to value-based all the way up to risk. Full risk is where we think we serve the population as well as our provider community the best. So we assume all the downside, we prepay the upside to the providers, Taking the shoulder, uh, but taking the or shouldering the risk situation of overspending, and thought, how can we do that unless we've got a proven methodology? And so that's what Upstream does. Uh, we've talked about data today. We've talked about burnout. We've talked about having a rapport with the physicians or the patients, and how do we pull all of that together? So I'll talk a little bit about what Upstream has done. One of the things I want to it's a little light lighthearted here. When does somebody want to identify when did um, data and the internet really start? It's a joke. So, <laughs> anybody, any guesses? When when Al Gore invented it? Well, Al Gore is one, but I think it happened when Jesus came in, because Moses was the first one to download from the cloud and put it on a tablet. <laughs> I just hope that as healthcare we don't take just as long to adopt it and uh, Alan today was talking about how his eyes opened up wide once he saw this data. Um, the other thing is we're talking about an innovators network so I wanted to see, I wanted to try and see how do we fit into that innovation or innovators model so I put a couple of definitions. Um, 
and I want to differentiate it from being an inventor or an entrepreneur as well, but um, we need to generate ideas, and today, the thing that I was saying is this is an, I, we need to be transmitting or communicating these ideas amongst each other. Um, but the biggest part of innovation is you can invent something, you can start something new, but if it's not sustainable, you know, then it ceases to be an innovation. You know, it just ceases to be a, just another fly on the wall. So the idea is collaboration, ideation, implementation, and creating value. Only then can you be sustainable. So I'm going to talk from this perspective about what Upstream does. So the first thing, of course, is that we have to start thinking of medicine as a business. And we don't do that enough. And I was telling uh, a couple of people on my lunch table, on an average, and we saw in Alan's case uh, when he was showing that the number of dollars per patient spend and the number of patients in each of these boxes, on an average in this country, Medicare is about between ten and eleven thousand dollars per patient per year. If you take an average physician with three thousand or four thousand patients, that's a four hundred thousand dollar business. Find me another four hundred thousand dollar business that runs with three FTEs: a physician, a nurse, and a medical assistant. Typically, that's <coughs> what we end up having in our offices. You put ten offices together, and you've got a four hundred million dollar business. And you put a system like Allen's together where you have over $150,000, 150,000 patients, about, give or take, 200,000? So 200,000 patients, that's a $2 billion company. <coughs> and, and the resources that somebody like GE or Xerox or CVS put into managing that business, we don't think of it that way in healthcare. And that's one of our drawbacks, that you don't put enough resources, energy into running that business as a business. None of us would be practicing medicine if we had no money. I can guarantee you that. Maybe there are two people in our mm -hmm. entire conference that would be willing to practice medicine with no money at all. The rest of us are not going to do it. We're going to find something else. Whether we buy an ice cream parlor or run a strip mall, we will not be doing medicine if there was no money in it. And I think we can go back to the root cause of that, but that's another story. So bringing the clinical, financial, and like, we heard today, without data, this is not going to work. As physicians, we all manage patients only based on data. We don't start treating a patient for diabetes unless we've got a high blood sugar. That's data. And why don't we extend that use of data to everything else, whether it's precision medicine, that's data. The question is, how do we get all this data together? And that's been a challenge because EMRs are not there and the insurance companies like to hide all the information. They don't want to give you all that information. I, it's barely from the last four or five years that we even know what an average patient costs because until then nobody had no idea. CMS, all the government said was we don't have, we can't compete nationally because we have to spend too much in healthcare. Nobody knew how much, nobody cared what it was. But you know the physicians drive over 82% of all dollars spent in healthcare. And they don't directly spend that money, but they drive the cost of that, whether it's nursing home, medications, inpatient utilization, outpatient utilization. So we need to make sure that it becomes mission critical in terms of technology. And there are now so many companies doing that technology heavy lifting. But the first thing we decided to do as upstream is and we have one of our founders is from, from Ireland. And uh, I've lived in England for a few years. So this <coughs> looks like the metro system or the London Underground mm -hmm. is what we call it. <laughs> but we went through this process of identifying every stop the patient has to go through. And if you think about it, one patient going through all of this is 50 different stops. So we have to problem solve at every one of these stages, not in the front or the back or the back end. It has to be problem solved, efficiency, cost wise, resources wise at every step of the way. And we can go through this in real detail is contacting the patient. Like you were saying, 
you have to outreach. Now, how many of us have pets at home or have gone to a dentist? You get more postcards or mailers or phone calls from your veterinarian or your dentist than from anybody else. Why? They're cash business. They depend on you guys coming, uh, coming, bring, coming back, not when you feel like it. And of course the dogs, how many of us actually think we need cleaning once a year? We don't even think about it because we are brushing our teeth every day, we are flossing, we are like, why do I need to go and see a dentist? And the dental insurance program sucks because you pay a thousand bucks, you only get $800 worth of benefit, and the rest of it is more, anyway. So, so the thing about it is, um, we need to be proactive. We need to contact these folks and try and figure out uh, how often, when do we do that. And this box, for those of you who missed, this is the chronic condition patients that have not had an episode yet and are tethering between becoming an expensive patient. So we've taken one step further where we have utilized data to, to have a predictive model. And our stratification, like Alan was saying, stratification could be done once every two weeks. We do it in real time. Because yesterday's blood work should influence a decision today. And it does that when you normally do your practice. So why should they do that from a technology perspective as well? And in-person appointment. You know, there's, there's a couple of studies out there in the Harvard Business Review where a very high percentage, I forget the number, 60, 70 percent of seniors that come to physicians' offices come for socialization, not to actually see the provider. And so two things in your front office, more coffee, more candy. Okay, and you will have more patients automatically. But those are not the patients you want. And you'll have them, but you don't want those. And two, who is the most important person in your office? Phones, probably. Pardon? Phones. For, no, the most important person. I would say phones. The they, receptionist? Yeah. Okay. So the receptionist or the, res, you know, the person on the front desk, yeah. behind that with glass window that they close, right? Uh, I was doing Interfaith Medical Center in, the, in Brooklyn, tough neighborhood, and uh, the first thing we did was went to the emergency room and took down all the partitions, and the staff were freaking out. People will kill us, and we asked the banking type of walls to be put up, bulletproof glass, because, you know, the shootings were going on. And I said, no, this is the, if you treat the people right, they will treat you right. And that happened with an experiment we had in Brooklyn Jewish, where Einstein had his gallbladder removed. Um, and the RH factor was discovered there. What we did was every day graffiti would appear on the hospital walls. <coughs> so we, I employed three painters that started from one point in the, on the walls and finished six days later and started again. Every day we would paint the walls white. So of course the first three months graffiti didn't change. But in the sixth month we had no graffiti. The neighborhood started seeing that, oh, let's not ruin this. It's looking nice, it's looking pretty. Christmas trees were stolen every year. Two years down the road, all the trees were there. Um, copper pipes were stolen every week. So we painted copper pipes aluminum. So they would steal the copper. So there is a way to change behavior and you need to make that happen through small changes, not big things. Don't worry about the big things, small. So in-person appointments, we want to make sure that what Alan is seeing in his hospital, empty waiting rooms, patient, because patients know now they'll get seen and they'll have enough time with the providers. Um, again, we've all known soap notes. If we didn't know the explanation, subjective, objective, um, assessment and plan. We've stopped doing that. And one of the things that and you, uh, sort of rung a note with you is, do we share this care plan with the patients? And in what form? Ah, you should have a colonoscopy. That's not a care plan. That says, listen, you've got a history, you're, you're this age group, the incidence of colon, colon cancer is this high. Maybe you should have it done at least three or four times in your lifetime, if not every other year or every fifth year. 
That's a care plan. Think about what we tell patients, go exercise. What does it mean? It means nothing to them. In the elderly, it means absolutely nothing. They think walking up from their kitchen to the bedroom is exercise. So you tell them, I should tell patients that go to the grocery store, walk every aisle, and at the end of the week, come back and give me one can's sodium content from every aisle. And they would do that like an exercise. And really, they realize at the end of it, and if you put your foot, you know, Fitbit on, if you walk through one of these stores like a Walmart or Target, it will be 12,000 steps before you come out of there if you've walked every aisle up and down. That's exercise. That's how you explain it. And we have an acronym for non-compliant patients. It's called Honda. How many of you have heard, heard the acronym Honda? Hypertensive Obese Non-Compliant Diabetic Adult. I wish we had one for Toyota and Lexus and everybody, but I have one for Honda. Um, in this, we know that the risk adjustment, the risk stratification requires coding. You know, we are struggling with ICD-10s. Now we're talking about CPD-2 codes, with Z codes, V codes, U codes, W codes. The WHO is already testing ICD-13 in some parts of the world. Do you think we'll ever get there at the rate we are going? No. Um, so understanding the entire cycle of patient care and billing and revenue and resources, we went through this exercise one step, one stop at a time, thinking where can we have the biggest impact. And the one thing that uh, Upstream did was that we decided to that we needed to have data to we needed to have data to manage patients so first we talked about getting a list of data points that we needed because of the stops we were talking about and we needed to find the source of that data so once we did that then we said for oh, which what role or type of person will solve the problem at which stop and what we came up with is that we felt that medication adherence seems to be the largest driver of high utilizers. They don't take their meds in time, they don't, can't, for various reasons, can't afford it, don't like it, you know, whatever, too many pills to swallow, all of those things. So we, we said, let's drive that through a pharmacist. So the upstream model is that, that we will provide staffing help to all our practices. So we create a team of individuals led by either a pharmacist or a nurse, supported by medical assistants, and we embed the clinical folks, the licensed folks, in the practices. We pay for that, we provide those services, we recruit for them, we retain them, and we support the practices in with in in office people and we provide a virtual concierge for each one of those staff members so in a practice of 4000 patients we would dedicate somewhere between 7 and 8 folks a nurse a pharmacist and maybe 5 MAs we take over all the scut work of the practice, calling patients, reminding them for appointments, following up on gaps in care, doing their med reconciliation, uh, interacting with the pharmacist, interacting with the insurance company on formulary and cost and co-pays. And we found that through that, that 18% of patients in the highest category, we were able to reduce their inpatient and ER utilization by 45%. That gave us the economics to incentivize more stuff. All the social determinants of health, all the health equity issues that we all face typically, we don't have enough time to spend with our patients on those issues because it doesn't pay. You have to see your 25 patients a day, otherwise the practice doesn't work. Or somebody's complaining that, hey, you're a money losing or a loss leader for us. So we said that if we can do this, 
how do we ensure that we can use those funds to fund other activities and resources? And you can only do that if you enter into full risk agreements with CMS or payers. So that's where we came in and said, we will take the risk, but you have to take our care coordination activities as a part of that. In addition, we'll bring all the technology. So we'll take the data out of your EMR, we'll combine it with the claims data from CMS or from the payers, and bring the financial and the clinical data together. We've got, I think, 18 artificial intelligence algorithms to not only stratify these patients, but substratify them. Which diabetic is likely to go to the hospital? Which diabetic is likely to be non-compliant? You know, those that go to McDonald's every day is going to be non-compliant. Not because they want to be non-compliant, it's just the nature of their activities. Bringing all of that together under one umbrella. And on top of that, so you can see this, the impact, this is a four-year um, proof, or four-year study based on data of what we found to be most effective. And these well patients, is supported by the same analysis we had, that you don't have to spend all your resources on running health fairs and wellness programs that really don't do a lot for the patient population. They're good community things, they're good field things. It gives the chance of the staff to be out there, you know, in the parking lot and create a little bit of a hub, but really not worth all the energy we spend on those patients. We should be diverting those resources and energies to a different subset of the population. Then you have the self-care components, and they are the ones who are patients who don't want, to, want your help. They don't want your help. They don't want any interference with, with their life. And it's pointless chasing them down for colonoscopies and mammograms. They don't want it. In fact, they take it, and it's, it, it's the reverse that happens with them. They then get really offensive, agitated, and cooperate even less. So don't, don't push it too hard. Find a way to communicate with them, but without pushing them to do that. Um, so the clinical team, like I said, it's still driven by the PCP. In some states, like North Carolina, where the pharmacists have independent prescribing privileges, over time, the physician will subjugate some of that activity to the pharmacist and say, don't worry, you can handle these kind of, don't have to come to me. I agree with your philosophy, I like you, you're working well with me, we'll give you more responsibility. That has helped us both with the nursing staff and the pharmacist, where we are letting the pharmacist and the nurses work to the, the highest point of their licensure. And that helps us recruiting, because that they don't find. Anybody who's in CVS and Walgreens and the pharmacies, the pharmacists are pill counters, really. You know, they don't do much more than that. But we give them the ability to engage with the patient, the ability to engage with the provider, and actually make serious recommendations. Um, the, in a in couple of our places, once we reach a cohort of providers and patients of about 40,000 lives, we actually create our own pharmacy and do pill packs and do dispensing ourselves. Why? Because medication adherence is in real time then. I don't know if you know Surescripts. They will send you the data, but they charge your insurance company or Medicare the day the e-prescription hits their pharmacy. If the patient doesn't pick up the pharmacy, the medications, it's after 30 days they'll reverse the charges. So for 30 days you're in a blind spot. You don't know whether the patient has actually picked up the meds and or not, and then you're in a second blind spot whether they have picked up the meds and they're actually eating them or not. That's where remote monitoring devices come into being, where if the blood pressure suddenly shoots up, at least you can ask the question, hey, did you take your meds? Because we noticed your blood pressure going up. And that comes back to another thing, that our data now is in real time. All of this has worked out technology, so the data comes in in real time. And we found medication adherence went all the way up to 99%. What did that help us do? It helped us negotiate better MA contracts because for, Medica for the Medicare Advantage contracts, 
the medication adherence quality measures are weighted three times as much as the non-medication measures. It's the game that the MA plans play with CMS. So you have to support that if you want to play in the same game. The anecdote there for me is that you're playing football, 10 yards is first down. You can't go after nine yards to the umpire and say, I didn't do anything wrong, I didn't spit on anybody, I didn't swear, I didn't hit anybody. Can I get my 10, you know, 10 yards? Can I get my extra yard and be my first down? Do you can say no. You have to play the game. If you don't play the game, you're going to be out of it. So I, I'm, I apologize for calling it a game, but it really is by playing by the rules. You've got to maximize and optimize how you use the rules for your own good or your own favor. And so we have to make sure, creating value, creating sustenance, that every one of the stakeholders in our whole healthcare ecosystem have some benefit out of this. And so that's what we end up doing. And this is how what has helped us save organizations, give the physicians. Now, one of the things I haven't mentioned here is what we call gap Q, guaranteed advanced payments for quality. We do not, we pay an upfront PMPM -PM on every patient that the provider has, that we assume risk for. And that amount is dependent purely on the provider's quality score, not the ACO's quality score, not the practice's quality score, but the individual provider's quality score. So, we are rewarding the providers directly for their own performance. And it's guaranteed up front with no take backs. <clears throat> so you can see that every all the quality scores are converted into a stars rating, which is that's important for the MA plans and CMS. And based on individual scores, as every tenth of a point the score goes up, the dollars per patient go up. All the way from a base of 15 to a high of $30. And what that has done is, if you, if you think if you have 400 patients, that's going to give you $6,000 a month at a very minimum, as much as $15,000 a month in advance payments for the practice. So if you think of motivation, it can't be a bigger motivation because it frees up resources within the practice. Um, we can talk more about our And what we're looking to do is, is expand. We are managing around 200,000 patients right now between South Carolina and North Carolina and Virginia. And uh, our strategy is to find a way to hit a million lives by next year, 2024. Happy to take questions. Talk more about us.